Greetings, I'm Roberto Valdez, Master of the Science of Geography and Instructor of History at Northern New Mexico College in Española, New Mexico. Let's talk about cultural regions, specifically what makes the American Southwest cultural region, also known as El Norte Mexicano, special and set apart from other regions. A region is an area of geographic space with a set of unifying characteristics that set it apart as unique and different from its surrounding areas. We begin by discussing cultural regions at different scales using three concepts. You will learn to define the core of a cultural region on the basis of three characteristics. You will also be able to see a sphere of that cultural region which is basically the furthest extent of those cultural traits. I want you to know and better understand the geography and history of the American Southwest, also known as El Norte, uh, El Norte Mexicano, a portion of which that can be considered greater New Mexico. I would like us to be able to identify and think about cultural traits that make our subregion distinctive versus those that are shared with the rest of the United States of America, and uh, recognize imagery and symbolism as it is used to promote regional identity and recognize that cultural or regional identity often promotes one's group's identity while excluding that of others. So here we have three examples or kinds of regions. The formal region, the functional region, and the vernacular region. So geographers, when they present these three kinds of regions, uh, the first on our list, formal region, um, involve some kind of dominant characteristic that can be identified as a unifying a geographic area. The second kind of region called the functional region is a geographic area with a kind of network that can be identified and tied to a central point, a hub, or as we call it, a node. A mapper or illustrator can depict the functional region as looking something like a wagon wheel or a bicycle wheel with all the spokes tied to that hub. The third type of region uh, is called a vernacular region. Vernacular regions are perceived in people's minds as having some kind of unifying characteristic, but it's in the mind. In the example shown here at right, a hypothetical city built along the shore of an ocean and having a river has neighborhoods that are thought of as having characteristics distinct from one another. Depicted is a downtown, a warehouse district, the arts district, Little Italy, and the suburbs are called the burbs and so on. <clears throat> Let's say you might be able to better understand what a formal region is. If you think of it as a unit of uniformed military personnel all lined up in file, looking mostly the same because of the clothing that they are wearing with variations of height and facial skin color and appearance. In this same way, a geographic area might have a dominant characteristic that gives it a uniform quality. States of the USIE are formal regions. Uh, so shown here, for example, we have New Mexico and a collection of the New Mexico state statutes. So the state is in its geographic integrity united by how it uniformly applies that law all over the entire state. In this case, from Farmington in the northwest to Hobbs in the southeast. In this next example, we can identify a set of formal regions, uh, but um, kind of different. In 2003, the Department of Geography uh, and Cartography in uh, Central University of Oklahoma called people from throughout the nation and to ask them what their favorite word uh, for um, a um, carbonated soft drink refreshment was. And the responses were mapped out and formal regions appeared. Not everybody calls refreshments the same thing, by the way. Uh, the brand of Coca-Cola, for example, was developed in the late 19th century and saw distribution from Atlanta, Georgia. As a consequence of the shortened version of the name Coca-Cola, you have Coke. There appears that popular name in the southern states extending all the way to New Mexico. And I can testify that in our northern counties in the state of New Mexico, Coke is our favorite word to talk about any soft drink be it Pepsi, Dr. Pepper, Sprite, 7-Up, and of course Coca-Cola. In northern New Mexico, when someone asks you if you would like a Coke, you might respond with, well, what kind of Coke do you have? And you end up selecting a root beer. 
In other parts of the country shown here in blue, the word pop is the most popular word to use for carbonated refreshment. And those areas depicted in uh, beige, such as New England, uh, part of Wisconsin, parts of Missouri and Illinois, and a region stretching from Arizona to California, they favor the word, the use of the word soda. And I'm sure there are other variations or combinations like soda pop and other things out there. There's a green color depicted on the map, and those are areas that refer to carbonated refreshment by some other name. As you can see, it's not common. Now, in this next example, we have a world map depicting climactic regions or climate regions. Once again, formal regions show up when geographers map out unifying characteristics. For example, there are tropical regions where it rains heavily here, running in a band all the way across. And so um, it rains heavily in um, here in the Amazon, here in the Congo, and here in Indonesia. In the Northern Hemisphere, a band of arid regions that stretch from here to here to here really hits here from the, from uh, Pakistan all the way to the American Southwest. Lo and behold, that's part of a larger region of subtropical deserts. Um, so north of them appear regions of temperate climates, like for example here in the northeast of North America, Europe and um, into Russia and uh, so that's temperate and humid by comparison. We're going to examine the unifying characteristic of the physical appearance of the landscape and um, uh, it's according to to the major features that can be categorized by geographers. Uh, Basin and Range uh, features large, large open uh, semi-arid grasslands and they are interrupted by isolated mountain chains that are like sky islands or a forest. It stretches all the way from, as you can see right up here, Oregon uh, into uh, the southern uh, uh, southwest and into northern Mexico. So um, Arizona, much of New Mexico, Baja California, Sonora, Chihuahua, the Big Bend area of Texas, Nevada, parts of California, even Utah and Idaho and into Oregon, are all part of the Basin and Range physiographic system, physiographic uh, region. And in Mexico, there are two major mountain chains, the Sierra, the Sierra Madre Oriental, which is here, and the Sierra Madre Occidental, here, and uh, another chain running here. These box in the Basin and Range region. Uh, it's called the Central Mexican Plateau. Now, notice also this area here called the Colorado Plateau. Uh, Colorado Plateau is a special area. It's a uh, high elevation. Uh, it's uh, dominated by red-orange colored soil, although that's not true in all of the region. And uh, it is uh, relatively arid, and there's a lot of exposed bedrock in this region. And then now let's look at the southern Rocky Mountains. This part of the Rocky Mountains stretching from Wyoming all the way into north central state of New Mexico features a short or non-existent growing season. Uh, in the east we have very large flatlands or rolling hills. It's the Great Plains right here. They are windy, or windy relatively waterless, and they, they have offer vast expanses that suffer a, a periodic uh, drought, and we'll talk more about these later. So let's uh, address the definition of a functional region. You'll get better insight when you realize that you'll recall that I compared it to the spokes of a wagon or a bicycle wheel because it's built around a hub or a node. It's a region networked to a center point, not necessarily the mathematical center. So in this example, regions of the United States have urban areas with very important or uh, major banks. And um, for example, let's take uh, the example, oh, let's say uh, Dallas, Texas, Fort Worth area. All that oil money obviously fueled a, a banking empire headquartered there in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And it, notice it has tentacles that reach out in all directions to Arkansas, Louisiana, 
<clears throat> all over Texas. Uh, Oklahoma, which also is an oil producing state, but also that section of New Mexico that is oil producing, namely a place like Roswell. So uh, banks of lesser prestige and funds in their accounts operate in a service network area. And they are led by these major regional banks. So, uh, like in the case of the of Roswell, uh, it operates in the realm of the Dallas banks. And for northern New Mexico, such as Albuquerque and Santa Fe, Albuquerque and Santa Fe, they are tied to the hub of Denver. And so, Denver, Colorado has a uh, network of banks stretching all over into Wyoming, Utah, and so forth. In this way, we can see that functional regions can operate differently than a formal region, such as seen in the individual states of the United States. The vernacular region is perceptual. It's based upon cultural ideas. This is where we take a cultural idea or set of ideas and then perceive them to apply to a geographic area. The north central state of, uh, of uh, New Mexico is known for its um, restaurant cr cuisine using chile. And yes, some say chili, but it's chile with an E, and we spell it that way with an E here. Now, let's detail the vernacular regions. They, these have a variation in the intensity of their cultural features that we perceive. To simplify their illustration, we geographers employ what we call a core domain and sphere to perform a cultural analysis. An analysis. The uh, core is a heart, hearth, or a nucleus uh, of a cultural region. And the next is the domain where there is a high intensity of the given ideas that we have about what defines the region. And then there is the sphere, where some characteristics can be found in an ever wider geographic area, but they fade, fade, fade out into the edges and then disappear. For purposes of illustration, you can see that the three rigidly defined but characteristic uh, of the geographic phenomena are often like a sliding scale of tone from dark intensity and a fade to zero. For our purposes, we will use the core, uh, core, the domain, and the sphere to talk about what is the American Southwest or El Norte Mexicano. In this illustration, we will use the example of the American South, first of all, to get you used to the idea. Let's take six ideas about how we might define the American South. Like, uh, first we'll consider the old boundary of the Confederate States of America. In the 1860s, during the Civil War, a number of states of the United States separated or seceded from the Union. It is, uh, this is illustrated on the map with a dark boundary. The dominant and widely distributed division of Christianity called Baptist is strongly present in the southern states of the United States. This region also offers a long growing season. Any goodly amount of water, uh, winter rain that makes this region excellent for agricultural use includes some crops that require long growing seasons, demarcated by when the first and the last frosts occur. For this reason, in our key, or legend, we here include winter precipitation more than 20 inches. Let me circle that for you so you can see it, just in case you're not seeing it. So it's right in here here now we have the last frost in march here and we have the cotton producing area here in a brown line and uh, we have um uh the other characteristics and i'm going to get to this one that um, that is it requires some explanation it's the uh, fewer than 50 percent high school graduates now uh you have to realize that the winners of the american civil war in the of the 1860s uh, the North, uh, came to dominate and impose their system of education on the American South. So the modern states of the United States have, have a long tradition of being more industrialized than the southern states that by a consequence of their environment were more oriented towards agriculture. This may particularly explain why the South has a history of fewer than 50% high school graduates. Nevertheless, we'll use it as one of the six categories to define the American South when these different categories are mapped out and overlaid on each other, we can see by using the key on the extreme right, which is here, green, dark green, uh, that we can call the core of the American South. So you can see it all in here. So 
Uh, now you have an idea of what a core looks like. The colors graduate to lighter and lighter tone to illustrate that there are fewer and fewer definitions of the South applicable to the marginal areas of what we would consider the American South, which is way out here, stretching into Missouri and even Virginia. In this next display, we only show the core, the domain, and the sphere of the Mormon cultural region. So it's only those three categories. In this you can see, now let me select my highlighter pen again, uh, here. right in here, this corridor by the Great Salt Lake is uh, a belt embracing the cities of Ogden, uh, Salt Lake City, and Provo, Utah. The domain is a uh, uh, geographic area over much of the state of Utah, but includes por portions of uh, Idaho, um, uh, Wyoming a little bit, um, Nevada of course, quite a bit, and the very northern edge of the state of Arizona, right in here. Whoops, I didn't draw it very perfectly, but there you go. And um, in this area, Mormons have a strong presence, but may not necessarily be the majority in a given town. The area shown in light gray, which extends all the way from uh, here in Oregon to the northern state of, the, of Chihuahua, Mexico, um, this... Um, region is populated by Mormons rather scattered. Uh, in, in Chihuahua, Mexico in particular, they are farmers and they, they're businessmen and they operate in towns such as Casas Grandes, Chihuahua. But notice there is also a presence here in uh, the Valle San Luis of the state of Colorado. Once again, we have core, domain, and sphere. Now, um, let us move on to the main feature of our presentation. And our main feature is about how we might go about defining the U.S. Southwest as a vernacular region. We uh, address, uh, let's say, uh, Anglo-America. Anglo-America is that part of, the, of North America that is English-speaking. It's the United States and it's Canada. So it's anything north of the U.S.-Mexican border. Uh, later we can quibble about the true extent of how far northward Latin America extends. It actually overlaps into the United States. But for now, we're going to look at Anglo-American partition according to political boundaries of states and between the two sovereign nations of the United States of America and Canada. Uh, many are persuaded to believe that the core region of the United States of America is that portion that includes the large cities out in the North Atlantic seaboard from Boston to Washington, D.C., and extending westward to include Toronto, Canada, Detroit, Michigan, Chicago, Illinois, and St. Louis, Missouri. So let me just circle it in red for you here. It's this. That's our core. At least that's what some are persuaded to believe. Now, uh, situated southwest from that core is the states of Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona right in here. See that? We are southwest of a core. Now, for those of us who are native to New Mexico and find it to be our homeland and our center, we are not southwest of anything. But for the most part, the center of industry and attention, both economic and social and political of the United States, rests in that region labeled the core. And we here in New Mexico are considered a periphery, a flyover country. What an insult, right? But nevertheless, that's how you get the name Southwest. We are also considered a borderland. I should point out once again that this map is using political boundaries. There are other ways to interpret and define the U.S. Southwest. Um, I already hinted that, uh, that it, and by referring to it as El Norte Mexicano. So we have here the states of Mexico. It is divided into states, estados as they call it, Estados Unidos Mexicanos. And uh, as we examine there, our neighbor to the south, many of you may be aware that in the same way that the United States is divided to east to west, in which the east is urban and the west is rural, Mexico is also divided politically, socially, and uh, economically, but in a north to south dichotomy. As a professor I had back in the University of New Mexico once said, the southern portion of Mexico consists of numerous and strong um, Colombian, pre Columbian Indian nations that still maintain many pre Columbian beliefs. Uh, hinted at by the famous uh, Dia de los Muertos celebration. 
The south of Mexico, he said, is primarily urban, pagan, and superficially Roman Catholic. The north of Mexico has a cultural affinity with the ranch culture, a population of mestizos and descendants of Spanish, and uh, is strongly Roman Catholic. So the politics of the two re uh, regions often diverge as well in major elections that they have. Um, and there are there's an entire topic on that as well that you can look in the internet if you so desire. In this map of the United States of, in Canada, we have a selection of vernacular regions identifying different folk cultures, but without the scheme of using core, domain, and sphere. So they're just areas that we are outlining. Um, notice, um, let's see, I'm gonna, let me get my pen here. So notice um, here along the border, right here, in te of Texas and New Mexico and Arizona. This one is a strongly Mexican culture, ident so identified in the key here as green Mexican. Now, uh, these areas in brown that exist uh, right here, 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 and smaller areas here, and here, and here in Oklahoma, these are uh, associated with pra uh, Plains Ranch culture, according to the key. Now, the er areas here in magenta, that's here and here, those areas are strongly American Indian in culture, especially here, the Pima and the Papago, also known as the Tohono O'odham, and an even larger area here of Navajo and uh, uh, Hopi and even some Ute or Utah Indians. So um, their culture is very strongly apparent here if you've ever traveled to the place. And then we have over in here in light blue the Mormon culture that we examined earlier. And uh, here in, in the western part of Colorado, right in here, is a section of the mountain western folk culture, like over here in Montana and up into Canada. Um, and finally, here in the northern state of New Mexico, let me point it out with a line right there, like that. This is identified as Highland Hispanic culture. Highland Hispanic culture. As is readily apparent, we are encouraged to re-spatialize or examine uh, physical and human systems independently of political boundaries when we look at this. That's what re-spatialization is. The examination of spatially distributed phenomena of physical and human systems independently of political boundaries. So... Let me show you something else. The 100th Meridian. Uh, it's written about in uh, old accounts from the 19th century. Um, you should be aware about how environment is a determining factor on cultures. And that's why I point this out. Uh, humans are subject to local climates. So local climates and uh, their culture accordingly reflect this. In the late 19th century, migration of Americans westward across the 100th Meridian fueled reports in media and even in the political halls of Congress about the aridity of the West, with the exception of the Pacific Coast, of course, which we see here. Let me point it out with my pen again. Here we've got some moisture, and here we got some moisture. Uh, but west of the 100th Meridian, a bunch of the western states, with exception of these high mountains, stretching all the way into northern New Mexico, there's a few islands, those have, the land has low precipitation. So, the perception of Easterners, however correct it may be, that the western states are dry, guided much decision-making and even mistakes by decision makers in the eastern states about how to manage uh, land, water, and biodiversity in the western states. However, populations who were cultures of habitat in Mexico's El Norte knew nothing else and had adapted accordingly before the land and water managers from the eastern states showed up on the scene and dammed up the rivers and subdivided the public lands into grazing districts. So, um... Nevertheless, proponents of progress towards modernity inevitably sought to control nature. Before the control of nature, cultures adapted to modes of living according to the circumstances. So let me let's visit uh, this author. He uh, his name is D. W. Uh, Minig, and he was an American geographer who wrote the book entitled Southwest: Three Peoples in Geographic Change or Geographical Change, 1600 to 1970. 
He asks the questions about why the Southwest came to be an identifiable geographic region. He's just one among several scholars, but I point him out as rather groundbreaking because he presents the Southwest as a region bounded on the West, the North, and the East by broad zones of difficult country. For this, I would like to take you on a journey using Google Earth to illustrate what he identifies. World climactic regions are tied to locations along bands of latitude. And we're going to highlight that here. You see that? Bands of latitude. I've wrapped the Earth in what is a tropical, a subtropical, a temperate, a subarctic, and an arctic region. We're going to lighten it up so you can see North America and how it works out. Let me also throw in the borders and labels of the United States so that you can better see. Here's New Mexico, Arizona, Texas, and so forth. And as you can see by the colors, uh, the U.S. Southwest and El Norte Mexicano is mostly lying within the subtropical zone, shown here in salmon magenta color. Uh, that worldwide features most of the world's area of deserts. It's also within the southern latitudes of the temperate zone, shown here in light purple, right up in here. So the area of North American deserts is quite extensive, and let me show you those right here. So those are desert areas. Um, it stretches from the Mexican plateau here all the way to Oregon and Idaho, and up into Wyoming. It includes all or most of Nevada, Arizona, New Mexico, and so forth. But now let's move on to look at the ecological regions. So, for example, if I highlight the Sonoran Desert right here, you can see how extensive it is and that it includes an area that includes the famous saguaro cactus. You know those cactus. They stand up, they look like people, they have arms, they're quite tall. That's the saguaro cactus and they live in the Sonoran Desert. Now let's look at the Mojave Desert here. Let's slide in right there. So this lays, this is lying and being situated to the west, and it's a landlocked region mostly embraced by California and the southern state of Nevada. Now let's look at the Colorado Plateau, which lays to the northwest. It is a vast area of uh, high elevation and uh, features red-orange soil and sandstone bedrock, like I mentioned before. Now let's look at the southern Rocky Mountains. This is to the north, and it is a large region of high elevation areas with snowpack that melts in the spring, and it feeds the rivers. In historic times, uh, American Indian tribes camped in these mountains, and uh, they would uh, spend their summers there. And then, for the winters, they would winter in the lower areas of the Great Plains. And one particular area of the Great Plains I'm going to uh, um, highlight for you, that's this one, the Southern Shortgrass Prairie. Southern Shortgrass Prairie. So, mm, this is an area of, uh, that's relatively flat. It's windblown. It's relatively waterless. It's an arid grassland, and it has high elevation areas. The most particular one that I can point out to you is here. It's called the Llano Estacado, or Staked Plain, in Spanish. <clears throat> Let's look at the Chihuahuan Desert. So this is to the south. It's a vast area of semi-arid grassland and shrubland desert. It's called the Chihuahuan Desert, and it embraces the southern section of the state of New Mexico here, uh, the Big Bend area of Texas here, and then southward into the central Mexican plateau. Now I argue that the Chihuahuan Desert is a south zone of difficult country because it completes the encirclement of the southwest and El Norte Mexicano. These images were taken in the Chihuahuan Desert ecoregion in the Jornada del Muerto, or Dead Man's Journey, a large waterless expanse between Las Cruces and Socorro, New Mexico. This dark green is the temperate sierras, and this light green is the semi-arid highlands. Look at this. There's an area around Albuquerque or Al Albuquerque left rather blank. Hmm. It's in the upper Rio Grande region of New Mexico. Let us now eliminate all the eco region overlays and examine the physiographic regions that were introduced to you earlier. 
Whereas ecoregions are based on distinctive uniformities in ecologies, physiographic regions are based on landscape type. Okay, so all this area right in here is uh, the central Mexican plateau. It's called the Altiplanicie Mexicana. And it is a high elevation, an arid area, hemmed in by two mountain chains. Uh, they're called the Mother Mountains, uh, two of them shown here. Uh, this is the Sierra Madre Occidental and the Sierra Madre Oriental, like we mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. The area here in light brown, stretching all the way into Idaho and Oregon and even into Canada, is an area of a basin and range physiographic region that feature arid deserts, grasslands, and isolated mountain ranges. <clears throat> and as indicated by the echo regions layer, we have the Colorado Plateau, which is embraced by four states known as the Four Corners States, or Four Corners for short. The central, or I'm sorry, the southern Rocky Mountains, as shown before, have a short growing season for crops. And then you have the Great Plains <clears throat> to the east, which feature vast areas of rolling hills and grasslands with periodic droughts. See, this is the Rio Colorado. And this is the Rio Grande. Subordinate to the Rio Colorado is the Rio Gila, another river system right in here. So um, uh, these two rivers are notable for originating in the southern Rocky Mountains. And they flow through desert regions. So as they flow through de desert regions, um, they initiate a special um, life zone along their river banks. Uh, riverside life zone, which is called a riparian ecosystem. Riparian ecosystem. Both um, had tribes of American Indians who pursued agriculture along their banks by diverting or using the water from these river, river systems. Um, these were the people uh, around present-day Yuma, Arizona, which is right in here, in the southern area of Arizona and into Mexico, San Luis, and the Gulf of California, and the sea, also known as the Sea of Cortez. Um, and also, most particularly, along the Rio Grande, the upper Rio Grande, here in New Mexico. Now, <clears throat> we need to point out that the uh, aforementioned Pueblo Indians, and I'm going to zoom into them so you can see better who they are, what they do, and so forth. Let me lighten it up. Um, so the Pueblo country, as it's called, uh, Pueblo Indian country stretches from Taos in the north. I'm going to zoom in here so you can see it better. Now, um, in historic times, there were Pueblo people living uh, much further to the south. Let's drift to the south, as shall we, to Socorro. All of this was Pueblo country as well. Uh, let's drift to the east. We're going to drift past Grants and San Rafael on a band stretching all the way to the east to a place called Zuni. Zuni. And then that's not just... Zuni is built along the Rio Zuni, a small river, but here we have some other pueblos that are... Uh, that they specialize in dry farming. They extend way out here. So when we attempt to perceive the southwest region as a vernacular region, we may associate with it uh, certain symbols of culture. Um... The symbols serve as a popular identifiers, especially when people outside our region visit us as tourists and attempt to describe some of the exceptional features that some of us locals uh, are taking for granted. Let me show you a few of them. So the upper right photograph is an example of Adobe agriculture, uh, art, I'm sorry, architecture. The architecture of the right photographs is an example of, um, of Adobe architecture, Adobe. So the D is pronounced like a TH, adobe. And it is a word that originates in Arabic that was picked up by the Spanish. The architecture is a product of the semi-arid environment and buildings um, that are made uh, of them, uh, the sun-dried bricks, um, are not going to dissolve quickly because we have low precipitation here. Next, we have a display of red chile ristras, as we call them, ristras. Food. Um, they are, after all, a food staple here in New Mexico. Many also believe that coyotes, which are shown here at the lower uh, left, <clears throat> are a symbol of the American Southwest because their range is quite extensive um, throughout the Southwest, but many people don't know this. They extend far beyond that into most of North America, all the way into Canada and down into Mexico. 
So let's identify these as popular identifiers. But let's not quit here. Let's move on to, to more. And watch, you'll sh see that um, other than Adobe Architecture, Cuisine, and Coyotes, we have the rivers, the Rio Colorado and the Rio Grande. And the one shown is the Rio Grande. Rio Grande del Norte is its full name. So as mentioned earlier, the Colorado River, or Rio Colorado, uh, that carved the Grand Canyon, uh, is famous for its picturesque landscapes, which we'll be show seeing in a moment. And uh, the Rio Grande, which is shown here, flowing past the Sierra Sandia, the watermelon mountains, uh, near Albuquerque or Albuquerque, they're notable. These both rivers are notable for their flow through desert areas. Now let's look at Rainbow Ridge, Utah. The Rio Colorado flows through an exceptionally picturesque sandstone canyonlands that feature arches and cliffs and pillars. And the southwest states of the United States feature high, uh, a high density of national parks and monuments. The selection featured here, called Rainbow Bridge, in the state of Utah, is at the edge of the Powell Reservoir, which was created by the Glen Canyon Dam on the Rio Colorado. As a consequence, a large amount of canyonlands is submerged below water, but is visited by boaters. Boaters on the reservoir, a uh, Powell Reservoir. Another set of cultural symbols involve American Indians. Uh, they have exceptional traditions such as dances, as the deer dance depicted here in the photograph to the right in the Pueblo de San Juan, also known as Okeawinge. Now, they also include, you know, um, other pueblos, Navajo, Apache, Ute, um, uh, and, and so on. And the Southwest has an exceptionally high population of American Indians. Um, and this is due to the precedents set by the Spanish, who had a policy of interaction um, and acculturation rather than that of forced removal. So for this reason, we rival uh, Oklahoma in the amount of Indians and in Indian reservations in, f uh, in Indian communities. In fact, it was the Indians uh, that lived in Pueblos and farmed the land that first attracted the Spanish. The presence of the Spanish also left its mark on the artwork that is considered exceptional to the region of the Southwest, such as at the extreme left, the tinwork, a tinwork piece, and um, in the middle, wood carving. Tinwork and wood carving are among those things. These are considered Mexican American or Hispanic art. And it depends because there are people here who identify themselves as Hispanic or Spanish and others who identify themselves as Mexican-American. Now let's look at the, some more cu um, cultural symbols. The saguaro cactus. You remember I was telling you about them? They're, they're tall. They look like they have arms. That's them. Saguaro, they're called. Saguaros, Indian ruins, and once again, picturesque landscapes. So, um, although the saguaro cactuses are a favorite symbol of the American Southwest, as well as northern Mexico, the truth be told, the range of this cactus is only than the southern one-third of the state of Arizona. Nevertheless, the arid environment has exceptional plant and animal life, as you can see. And the presence of American Indians in the region for such a long time, of course, building their square buildings of rock and mud, in this case, such as this cliff dwelling, is not typical in other parts of the United States. And then let's go to Spanish missions, Spanish missions. These are uh, regionally established to assist in the conversion or were established in to assist in the conversion of the American Indian people to Roman Catholicism. And there were several orders that came out here to do it. The Jesuits in Arizona, which was then called the Pimeria Alta, and along the Rio Grande Valley, they were called the Franciscanos or Franciscans. So as the uh, Spanish had outlawed expeditions of uh, conquest after the year 1573, the driving force was the diffusion of Roman Catholicism into El Norte Mexicano. As a consequence, old Spanish churches are, re, are, are a defining symbol in all of the borderland states with Mexico, 
and this one in particular is south of Tucson, uh, uh, Arizona. It's called Tumacacuri, Tumacacuri, which is the Pima word for uh, Caliche Bluff, essentially is what it means. Chamagi Gakuli, which was distorted and twisted into Tumacacuri. Now, one thing we're known for are tri-cultures. That's one of the many symbols that are used to give the American Southwest definition. Tri-cultures is the presence of the Mexican, the Indian, and the Anglo-American cultures in the same region. The one shown here, a mural on the wall at Douglas, Arizona, uh, depicts a Sonoran Mexican, a Chiricahua Apache, and an Anglo-American rancher. So perhaps we need to examine the distribution of the Hispanic population in the United States in order to gain some perspective. Shown is the data from the Pew Research Center that was compiled for the year 2011, and it shows Hispanic population greater than 25% in all the borderland states, as well as the state of Colorado and Kansas, with some notable populations into Wyoming, uh, Idaho, and Washington State. Now, I had students um, make, some, um, make some selections about what they thought the Southwest could be using a special software program and this particular one that you are seeing on display features coyotes, Hispanic population, or the high number of Hispanic population, and uh, watersheds of the Rio Grande and the Rio Colorado. As you can see, it throws the extension all the way up into Wyoming. Now, uh, in another opinion, the, students, uh, the student here selected Chile, or Chile, the high... Um, percentage of Hispanic population, and of course what is considered Mexican America, Mexican America. And her opinion uh, created a good definition of uh, three color shades that provides something like a uh, core domain and sphere. As you can see it, let me uh, highlight it for you. You can see darkness right in here and here, but it goes all the way into Texas. So this would be a core, and then there would be a lighter color domain, and then a sphere. In this third opinion, you can see the students selected a um, high um, percentage of Hispanic population, the presence of American Indians, which rivals that of Oklahoma, well, Oklahoma being right here. Let me point it out to you so you can see it. This is Oklahoma in eastern Oklahoma, and you can see how dark it is here, the Indian population here. So <clears throat> we rival Oklahoma. We have an de exceptional density of national parks. That was another selection of hers. And what we might see in these three opinions is that they have one thing in common, and that it being a strong association of the American Southwest to the Mexican culture or Hispanic culture in people's minds. To replicate the definition of the American South that was presented at the beginning of this lecture, I selected these six categories. Uh, to define the American Southwest and El Norte Mexicano. And the, these six categories were abundant sunshine, watersheds of the Rio Grande and Rio Colorado, the range of the saguaro cactuses, which is in the southern uh, third of the state of Arizona, uh, the strong presence of American Indians, which are in both states, uh, the range of, um, of 18th century Spanish missions, the high percentage of Hispanic people in the borderland states, and uh, uh, I excluded the Pacific Coast, California, and Gulf Coast, Texas, uh, as being uh, non-definitive of that of our region. So, green here represents the core, blue represents the domain, and uh, that great part that's outlined in red, uh, enclosing the light gray, represents the sphere. I was a little concerned that um, I embraced too much area, such as Wyoming and Nevada and California, but I came to realize that many Hispanics traveled to these areas to work in sheep or cattle ranches in the early 20th century. Now let's look at this. In the 2000 census, a selection of people were asked to provide their ancestry, and the results were compiled by county onto a map of the United States. As you can see, eastern Oklahoma and the Four Corners state, states there is a large population of Indians. Let me circle them so you can see them clearly right there 
and right in here. See that? So in the borderland states, even into Colorado and um, uh, southwest area of Kansas, and uh, people reported themselves to be of a Mexican ancestry. That's in this uh, light magenta uh, salmon color. Now, uh, an unusual exception occurred when the northern counties of New Mexico and those of southern Colorado declared, of all things, that they were of Hispanic or Spanish ancestry and augmented. It's that blue area that I'm making leap out of the page. These were uh, top ancestries by county, and as can be seen in the light blue, that pretty much encompasses uh, everything from Maryland, Pennsylvania, stretching all the way across to the uh, Pacific Northwest, <clears throat> you had people declaring themselves to be of German ancestry. Well, a swath running from the Appalachian Mountains uh, all the way to the northeastern state of New Mexico right here, they claim the, themselves to, have, to be of uh, uh, American ancestry. The last category were populations that asserted their ancestry to be English primarily living in the state of Utah and parts of surrounding states. Many of these areas are coincident with Mormon populations. Added to this are counties in Colorado, Texas, and New Mexico's Catron County, whose people asserted English ancestry, which we'll investigate next. It's important at this point, I say, to discover some aspects of the United States and why the Southwest would be considered the Southwest of a core. The eastern seaboard of the United States was once a collection of colonies of people who came from Great Britain and Ireland, specifically people who populated the northern colonies of what was to become the United States, came from the east of England. And let me highlight the, that for you here with my pen right here. So these went to what was called New England, specifically part of this area of uh, East England, um, eastern England, is called in, um, East Anglia. East Anglia. And uh, East Anglia, um, they have a peculiar accent there in which they do not pronounce their R's. And from the north of England, a team of people that would populate Pennsylvania would uh, go on to uh, migrate into the Midwest. And from the west of England and Wales, a team of people would populate Virginia and the lowland south. And let me point that out for you right here. Right here. This place, they do pronounce their R's. And uh, they pronounce them quite clearly, and it has influenced the American accent quite profoundly. We still pronounce our R's. I'm going to park my car, for example, is how most people in the United States talk. Now, <clears throat> um, there's another part of the north of Ireland, which is here the southern lowlands of Scotland and north of England. Uh, they, these people, they, um, they make their, made most of their livelihood uh, was tied up in livestock. And these people would populate Appalachian Mountains. In the next map, we'll see that the original population uh, established themselves, that established themselves on the eastern seaboard migrated westward into the interior of the North American continent and they were establishing their identities along the way as they moved eastward. So let me, with my red pen, Yankee Dumb this way, New Netherlands and Pennsylvania this way, Greater Appalachia this way, the Deep South this way, and so forth. So, for this reason, we see the appearance not of a United States, but of a collection of regions with primary cultural attributes that had been um, uh, represented as the 11 American nations. But um, it's not saying that the United States is not united with one standard culture, but variations uh, according to ancestry and modes of belief that have been passed down for generations do uh, vary from the region to region. Um, you'll notice that this map has a peculiar de definition or, or designation here in the southern part. Let me outline it with a highlighter pen so you can see it clearly. It's right here. It's called El Norte, right here. El Norte. So in this map, I will read 
for you some of the details but encourage you that if you want to know more just look it up on the internet to further your study if you're curious for el norte it says that it is the oldest uh, which is in uh, in a uh, yeah, dark yellow or orange uh, orange yellow this is the oldest of the uh, of the regions uh, it's the most culturally distinct and it's rooted in the spanish american empire the people here are said to value independence self-sufficiency and hard work i should also add that hispanic people have traditionally valued hard work over education because it is more uh, a pragmatic approach to earning a living that's not to say that hispanics do not value education rather that work is more practical than education and education has been used to assimilate hispanics as much as to prepare them for modernity so for the description about the far west which is in gray it says that the far west is uh, high remote and dry and it has been shaped more by the environment than by ethnicity and that is true there's a mix of ethnicities in the western states but it is driven by the environment much of the territory has become habitable only because of the railroads mining um, dams on rivers and irrigation residents have felt exploited by outside forces that have left uh, them resentful of corporations and lately the u.s government as well there's a large swath uh, here in uh, green of uh, called greater appalachia and it has played an influence in the american southwest you can see it extends into the very eastern part of the state of new mexico the description reads that its founders came from war ravaged ireland england and the scottish lowlands and they brought a culture forged by near constant danger and upheaval the people here value individual liberty and they're suspicious of aristocrats and social engineers this happens to characterize the cowboy and the desire of many southerners to protect their gun rights because their ancestors primarily made their living by livestock um, and because livestock are so easy to steal after all they do have four legs and can easily be driven off it required their owners to have a fearsome reputation to deter deter theft so let me read you also what it says about the midlands which are depicted here uh, in a sort of light pinkish color or light magenta that stretches all the way into the extreme northeast of new mexico they are thought of as being middle of the road people who swing votes during a presidential election such as in ohio half the state of ohio is uh, a midland uh, culture and uh, it says that they are rooted in the tradition of the english quakers and the german immigrants who believe that society should be organized to benefit ordinary people the value of the middle class or i should say they value the middle class and pluralism and they reject top-down government in any kind of or or any kind of strong ideology now uh, although this uh, covers most of the colors of new mexico i'm going to um, show you about enclaves enclaves of people from yankeedom such as what are, uh, are in and around the capital of santa fe that has an exceptional amount of left-wing politics <clears throat> that's not to say yankeedoms were originally left-wingers but it does say that they have a certain outlook on life that established certain enclaves in New Mexico. So it, for it, it reads, Yankeedom were settled originally, it's shown in red here, uh, by the way, if in case you're wondering, the red in the northern part of the United States. Um, they are um, settled uh, originally by in the states of New England by Puritans who valued the common good education and the broad citizen participation in politics and government much later there were irish who fled ireland because of famine and they embraced government intervention as a result of their anger against the english for among other things their failure to intervene during the famine these people are more comfortable with government regulation and social projects than are the other people it is important to note that in california which is here in termed the left coast I don't know if you can make that out in in your view uh the left coast it's people who tend to embrace left-wing politics but have a strong influence of the appalachian culture uh the narrative reads that the left coast combines yankee utopianism with appalachian exploration and self-expression and this makes certain areas of california left-wing in their politics 
but simultaneously a cutting edge inventive and oriented around business is what I found out in from other sources so there you are you thought the United States was all one so <clears throat> let's uh, as we draw uh, close to a conclusion of this lecture I want to have reinforced the definition of what culture is it is a body of customary beliefs material traits and social forms that together make a distinct tradition of a group of people it is shared understandings which guide behavior and values and condition a group's perception of the world now cultures uh, learn are learned from one another uh, from one passed down from one generation to the next and they evolve over time if this is all a bit difficult to remember recall that the word uh, culture is uh, etymologically related to the word cult which is a body of secrets um, or it's related to the word cultivate in that you grow plants cultivate although you may think of yourself as an individual you are part of a larger system guided by forces that preceded your existence that you inherit and you learn while embedded in your society so let's look at cultural landscape societies with a certain culture modified their environment in a certain distinct way and this creates what is called a cultural landscape we can define it as modifications to the environment by humans including the built environment um, such as cities and towns and agricultural systems and uh, other aspects of the group's culture physical processes and social relationships are combined in a unique way on the landscape the geographer terry jordan pointed out that there are artifacts of on the cultural landscape and uh, the cultural regions by their very existence proclaimed the adaptive virtues of their inhabitants the human modification of the earth is best understood as the consequence of imposing adaptive strategies upon the land i should add that there are um uh, sp speaking of uh, about life before the modern era which has introduced a lot of standardization uniformity and homogeneity uh, homogeneity to aspects of the built environment there are for example our chain stores chain supermarkets strip malls they often look the same in albuquerque as they do in many other cities in the united states but oftentimes in the small towns and villages there's a more approximate authenticity of the culture of the region on display let's look at this one uh, local example that i can call out for you is the system of acequias in new mexico that are an example of what mankind does to transform the landscape and make it even better uh, this is because acequias uh, bring greenery to a valley uh, they raise uh, water tables in people's wells they draw sediment from the rivers uh, they lower the summertime uh, and ambient temperature of the area that they flow through uh, which can be felt in a place like um, like albuquerque that by comparison to its counterpart the city of el paso texas which is a hot dust bowl in the summers is a place uh, of relatively pleasant uh, areas in especially in the valley the uh, albuquerque or alburquerque now you have to realize that acequias have been traditionally maintained by human cooperation which is a foundation to creating a stable society um people get together they clean them out in the spring they maintain them they partition water uh, according to uh, leadership uh, called a mayordomo and so forth and they were the first things to be constructed even before homes chapels or villages in an area when the first spanish settlers arrived in new mexico they set about to have an acequia dug and this was be and this was done in april i'm sorry uh august and uh, in september they set about to build the chapel and that's very typical first you build the acequia then you can think about other things so um i should also point out that the human built environments are guided by their courses because of the way they wind about uh, in the landscape many human built environments are anchored upon the course 
of Asekias. So, thank you, and this concludes the lecture on the American Southwest, or El Norte Mexicano, as a region.